chair back there. So uh, somebody, Josh, you might as well do it because you're going to be part of the uh, illustration too, you and your wife, if you can both come up here. Did you, you, did you want to come up here too? I, I, again, you can bring some message maybe a little bit later. So, uh, right here in the very beginning, right in the middle, so that they can sit. Josh, if you could have a seat right here. Your wife volunteered you for this. Uh, and I appreciate that, so you can just sit down. Um, what I was looking for is I, I needed a married couple. Because we're going through the Corinthians right now, and we're just at a passage where we're talking about marriage. And, and you qualify, you're married. And we needed, and I needed somebody who was disciplined. You are a disciplined individual. We could, I'm, I know for a fact I could pluck your hair. To, if you were told to stand in the position of attention, I could pluck your hairs out. I won't. You know, look at me like you'd kill me. But I could <laughs> pluck your hairs out, and you would just stay there. You, you're, you're a disciplined individual. So you're going to work just fine. And I also needed somebody in this relationship who's a little vindictive. Your wife. So if I can have one. <laughs> he said it, I didn't. <laughs> I appreciate this. I have soaked this. Okay. Uh, notice there's some plastic on this. This is a snorkel. Yeah. It is a, it's a profession. This is a real snorkel. Because when I asked for, get up here, young lady. When I asked for a snorkel, I assumed it was plastic too, and that was going to be fine, but this thing came in. So um, I'm going to have you do a couple things. One, you're going to put your mouth on here. And again, I've kind of washed it with bleach and stuff. It'll probably taste nasty. No, I just hot water. I don't know who had it before me. Who knows? <laughs> So you're going to put it in your mouth, you're going to put it in your mouth, all right? I'm not going to illustrate it because then it went there. Then you're going to hold your nose. So the only way you can breathe is through this tube. All right, that's it. Ultimately, though, you're in control of your nose. You know that. So you're, if you, at any time you feel threatened, you can pull away and you don't want to. I don't want you to. All right, I want you to self-control. Okay. You're going to be in control of not... You're, you're not really here to deprive them of air, okay? <laughs> but what you are going to be is actually the person who gives him air whenever you feel like you want to, okay? And you know what? He's a man. He can take this, okay? I, I'm convinced of this, okay? If you blow out, air will come out here. So uh, trust me, if you blow out here with this closed, you'll still blow out. Of course, you're releasing your air. Um, if you would like air... You could communicate to her without removing your nose. You could look at her, do your little whatever it is you do to get her to give you oxygen at your house. Uh, I would encourage you just a couple of times, let him go with that for a while. Just it's observation. I'm going to take a video. If you if you don't know it, this man is in the police force. He likes to be tortured. Um, am I right? You like that? He uh, he's been electrocuted. Shocked, and they videotaped it, right? And he's been, you've been maced, and, and you seem to like that too. Uh, and like it. you didn't like it, but you had to do it. They videotaped it. So this is just me videotaping how he does with oxygen. But you are in control every now and then. You know, you do know oxygen is a need. You knew that. So you're in the medical field, so you probably read that somewhere. That people need oxygen. Because <laughs> that would be something important to know. Just like... That's right, oxygen. You need that. So I'll take this plastic off your face. Because sometimes older men like to, they don't keep their hands to yourself, right? And, and you have to remember, they need oxygen. I can't do that. Okay, so are you ready? Place this in your mouth. Hold your nose. Okay, and then all you have to do is at any time just hold this right there. Okay. All right, so are we timing them? No, what are you doing? <laughs> no, tight, tight. We don't want him to breathe or anything like that. All right, so can he hold his breath for a long time? He can't, so maybe we should tip him. You think make him laugh? What? You got a funny story? Keep this to him. <laughs> like a Pillsbury boy. <laughs> so, if you would like oxygen, I mean, it's okay to ask for oxygen. Is it? <laughs> what? He's okay. It's being videotaped. He's all right. 
Did you give him oxygen? Dad, you're so, was that nice of your wife to give you oxygen? We <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> 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 Okay? And because of the way that 
this, this whole chapter goes, I'm going to put a lot of the scripture up here. But I do want you to go to 1 Corinthians 7 so you're familiar with it. You can read it later, later over and over. Especially if guys, girls want to take this home and say, that was an interesting study that we did today. Let's do a review. You may want to do that as a married couple. I don't know. But anyway, 1 Corinthians 7, I'm going to put them up here. And I'm going to kind of chop it up as we go. Are we about ready? 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 8. Go ahead and put that up there. You're going to think this is a crazy way to start a sermon on intimacy in marriage. All right. Now, for the matters you wrote about, remember the Corinthians are writing him, so now he's answering the question. Okay? So I'm assuming maybe some of you may have the same questions. You're about to get the answer. All right. It is good for a man not to have intimate relations if you were wondering what the intimacy was. It's up there. <laughs> not to have intimate relationships with a woman. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Most of you can go ahead and leave that up there for just a second, because most of you are thinking that is a crazy way to start a message on intimacy, if you will, right here. But you have to at least understand who the Apostle Paul is, okay? And you have to understand there's a theological truth that the Apostle Paul is not really addressing, but it's in this text. And I kind of want to reveal this to you before we get to the application. How many of you think marriage is important? Amen. How many of you don't think it's important? Good. I've got the right congregation here. Marriage is important. How many of you think that the church, the kingdom of God, is more important than your marriage. It, it, it is. It is. Remember who the Apostle Paul is. He's an evangelist. He said it, not me. He said it, although this is something that I'm drawn more and more into. He said, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was dead on. He was for the kingdom. He was for the eternal rewards that are the eternal nature of the kingdom. What you do for the church lasts forever. You understand that, right? What you do for the church has eternal ramifications. You lead a person to Jesus Christ, there are eternal ramifications. They're saved forever. In heaven, when you see them, you're like, hey, high five. Remember me? There's eternal rewards. Marriage, as important as it is, it's finite. You know what I mean by finite? There comes a day when... Your marriage will end. Remember the preacher? Uh, some of you had a really good looking preacher. Performing the services. Matt, Brooke. Remember that good looking guy? Caitlin. <laughs> Tim, that's good. You guys have a good looking preacher. Remember when he stood up in front of you? All muscular. Everybody eyes on the preacher. And they looked at the bride too, I'm sure. And he said, until death do you part. Remember that? That's what it is. See, Mormons will actually teach that when you die and you go to heaven, your marriage continues. And you become a god and you have all kinds of uh, spiritual babies and you, and you create your own universe. That's not what the Bible teaches. That, I don't look at you like that. That's what they teach. I'm sorry. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said this, and it should be up here. He said, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given into marriage. Marriage is finite. We got that. We understand that. The kingdom of God is eternal. But here's more logic for you. Okay, are you ready? If you are married, you have to, for your marriage to work, you have to give your marriage attention. Does that make sense? If you give your marriage attention, there are times that you cannot give the church attention. Does that make sense? It's, it's simple logic. And I'll show you the scripture there if you're like, no, oh, no, 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 it's all equal. As much as I love you, there's a time that as a pastor, I can't be your pastor. I have to be a husband. I have to take care of my, my duties. There are times when you call my phone that I, I think if you were to call it right now, I probably wouldn't answer. Uh, depending on who you were, um, don't do it. <laughs> but there are times when you call my phone and it says, listen, I'm here. I'm probably looking at your number right now, but I'm not answering it because I'm spending time with my family. 
So I, I, I have to do that. I, I have to put attention there. So I cannot be a focused on the church, if you will, 100% of the time because I have to be focused on what? My marriage, my family right there. Some of you say, well, is that scripture? Actually, it is. Put it up there. That's his first Corinthians. He says, I would like, this is the Apostle Paul, this is in that first Corinthians 7. He says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. Is that in that text right there, brother? I believe that is. All right. something real quick before we get on to some of the life application because uh, I, I think that some of us, most of us would be familiar with this. I think that that passage right there has done harm to certain groups of Christians. Um, Catholics. Okay. Do you know why priests don't marry? That one right there. Nuns don't marry, and they don't engage in intimacy, okay? That passage right there. They believe that if you're going to serve God, then the only way you can do that in that role is not to be married. That's unfortunate. Why? A couple reasons. Paul, even though you saw this in verse 1, says, I wish that you were like me. Most likely was at one time a married person. He was a Pharisee. You couldn't be a Pharisee unless you were married. I speculate he was either one of two things. He was a widower, his wife had died, or two, most likely, this is where I stand, when he converted to Christianity, his Jewish wife left him. That's my speculation. This is just guess. It's irrelevant. We know this for a fact. The apostles... Peter, put this text up here uh, where, where Paul's talking about marriage. He says, um, don't we have the right to take a believing wife even as the rest of the apostles and the brother of the Lord and Peter uh, do? The apostles were married. If you know anything about the Catholic Church, you know some of the problems they're having with their priests. Are we on the same page? A lot of the reasons they're having this page is because they put these restrictive... They, they put these restrictions on the people who are serving at a high position, and they set many of them up to fail. They want to serve the Lord, so they come in and they say, I'm going to serve the Lord, I'm going to become celibate, and I'm going to stay on the path, and I'm not going to get married. And then they live in a world that has a lot of temptations, and with the temptations, they give into it, and they bring harm to the church. That's not what that text is saying. I'm not for one moment suggesting that if you wanted to serve the Lord in, in, in a, a position where you're an evangelist, or your preacher, or your pastor, that you have to give up marriage, or whatever. It's not what it's saying. At all. Um, in fact, uh, just the opposite, as we're going to see here in a second. Did you know that there are temptations out there? The internet. I'm not going to talk about this long. One click away. Did you know that? Everybody's pretty much on the same boat right there. You want to, you, you, you have it there. Back in the day, you had to search in your dad's closet and underneath whatever to find stuff. Now it's a click away. Sitcoms. How many of you like comedy sitcoms? Is there one out there right now that doesn't have a strong, intimate theme? Even, I like that one show, um, what is it, Big Bang Theory? That's funny. Sheldon, that's my friend Dr. Scott, right? That is him in a mess, and I'm like Leonard to him, okay? And I love this show, but you can't watch it except for the strong... There's that strong thing. So it's out there. We know that. That's sad. The, the, the Catholics, they deny themselves, and they put them in a position to where the, the priest, at least, they want to say, I'm going to serve God, but I'm going to deny myself, and then they live in a world that is so, I, I guess, uh, focused on it, and they give it to the thing. This is what Paul says, okay? Here's what he did. 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Or is it 2? No, it's not. What do you want, this one? It's 1 Corinthians 7, 2, 9 up there. Yeah. But since there is sexual morality, remember what verse 1 said, I wish you were all like me. Verse 2 says this, but since there is so much sexual immorality, oh, I said it, didn't I? Since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own, what? 
wife, and each woman her own husband. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Okay. Remember, this is one aspect of marriage. One act. We got that? Put your picking nose, whatever up there. Let me tell you what he's saying. Let's pick on Tim. Tim, stand up. You're a man. You can see that by your manly presence. Later. When I'm not around. I have a washboard going on, buddy. Yeah, I know. Here you go. You have needs. It is to testify. No. Are those needs evil? No. No. They're real needs. Okay. Yeah, he, has, he has real needs, and they're not evil. And if you were to go without those needs, it would be like somebody stuck. They stopped the air from coming to you, and you would start to struggle. You know, and you'd be holding your nose, and you're like, I need to really release the pressure here. Okay. You have those needs. Okay. If you were not married, what Paul says this. You know what? It's better to get married than to burn with passion. Go ahead and sit down for a second. Because I want to address a few things here real quick. This is what the Bible says. This isn't just me. The Bible says that God will never put you in a, uh, in, in, in a place of temptation beyond your ability to withstand it. Did you know that? I'm going to illustrate this. Camera's going to do its best to follow me, but it's not going to be able to. Okay? You ready? This is what the Bible says. I want you to pretend, for whatever reason, that this is a computer. That's a mouse. Okay? And that's the screen. It says the Bible, the Bible says this, it'll never put you in a place of temptation that you're not. You don't have the ability to control it, okay? But that passage later goes on says, God will always give you a way out, okay? Here's what, here's what it means by that. When you are in a place of temptation, if you stay there too long, you will not be able to withstand it, okay? So, God gives you a way out. And the way out, generally, is you... Run screaming away from it. Okay, does everyone got that? Were you able to follow me on that? It might have been if I were prepared for that, but I know. Go over to the Jones Church because they're crazy over here. But I do preach over there too, more of the kid stuff, not adult stuff like this. Okay, um, when it comes to intimacy and the temptations out there, God gives us a few ways to be able to. Control. I'm going to give you three real quick, okay? Put your number one nose, Nikki, finger up in the air. One, some of you, he makes eunuchs. Some of you, he makes eunuchs. Do you know what that means? Okay? Either physically or you just don't have to design it. At all. The Apostle Paul actually calls that a gift. How would that be a gift? Well, quite frankly, if you don't have those desires and you don't have that particular need, you can focus 100% on the church, 100% on preaching the gospel, 100% on building the church, and you don't have the concerns of the institution of marriage. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Number two, and it's really implied in this first Corinthians, I don't have my eyeballs. What happened to my eyeballs? Huh? I don't have my glasses on, I can't see them. Oh, so <laughs> uh, first Corinthians, where is it? Got where is the second option? I know. I can't find it. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9. Got it? 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9. 
Now to the unmarried, look how I say it's good for them not to stay married as I do, but they cannot control themselves. Look what's implied, control themselves, and they should not marry. For it is be better to marry than to burn with passion. The second way, literally, to avoid temptation is this ability to try to control yourself. Now, I counsel people. I counsel people over in Champaign. I counsel people in, in Assault Light Ministries, and sometimes I come across marriage counseling, and there are times where women will come in, and they'll meet with me, and they will start, they will tell me how they were really hurt. My husband strayed. I said, he strayed? That's horrible. I'm sorry that this happened. Um, uh, so, you know, what are you thinking? What are you going to do? So I said, well, it's, it's okay, because, well, he's a man. I said, What? No, 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 no. He's straight, but it's okay because he's a man. So what are you smoking? I mean, that's that's not a justification, and I normally don't do that in counseling. I've already <laughs> determined what most people are smoking, and I already know. So I get the discernment. You can smell it, but you can't, John. Listen, if you're a man or you're a woman and you have these desires and you give in to them, you, you lack control. You're a well, you're a dog. Um, you know what dogs need? Commercial break. Show me a video real quick. Let's have a quick commercial break while I finish my breath. <laughs> Control yourself. We have an option. <laughs> <laughs> but God gives us another option too. First Corinthians 7, 2 and 9. He says, but since there's so much intimacy, you know, problems with, with that desire, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. For it is better to burn uh, with passion. Let me tell you what we preach and teach in our culture. And I've heard this. I have relatives that, that teach this to their kids. Okay? And maybe you said it, you taught it, you thought it, and, and you've embraced this. Uh, here it is. As, as teenagers, you know, the 18-year-old, unfortunately, we're talking much younger than that. But at 18, 19 years of, uh, of age, we have, our, we have our kids, and we say, you know what? They're, there's so much temptation. They're going to do it anyway. Have you heard that? So, because they're going to do it anyway, let's do a few things. Let's, number one, let's educate them on how to do it. I mean, if they're going to do it anyway, they need to know how. Uh, two, let's give them the ability to stop the baby from coming into this world. We don't want anyone to be, um, what is it, punished with a child. That's in our vocabulary. I believe a politician said that. Uh, and we want to protect them so they don't get any SDs, right? Which, you know what, if they're going to do it anyway, let's protect them. Let's make sure that we, we, we stop children from coming in. Let's make sure that, you know, that it's safe. It's safe. See, what we do nowadays is we no longer preach and teach purity of marriage. We preach safety with intimacy. Why? It's not, that's not a message on safety. You know what that is? It's a, it is a message against marriage. See, what the world says is, you're going to do it. Do it safely. But Christians teach and preach this. If you're going to do it, get married. Get married. That's one aspect of marriage. There's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing shocking, um, especially in, the, in, in today's culture. So here's Paul's argument all together, and we're going to get to a couple applications. One is this. The, the kingdom of God is important. It is more important than anything else. Your work with the kingdom of God is even more important than, than the work that you do in the ministry. However, we live in a, we live in a world where, where our temptations, our needs are very real and they're very evil. And if you are the majority and you have these needs and you have these desires, instead of burning with passion or trying to be celibate during this period of time, by all means, get married. All right? Now let's go to the application. And this is where maybe you, some of you want to take notes real quick. Here you go. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 4. The husband should fulfill his married, mar, mar, marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority, oh, some of you are just like going crazy on this, over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. The philosophy in the world is this, and, and you've heard this. I was watching a funny sitcom the other day, or a piece of it, 
and, and uh, it was talking about a woman who was not able to have children. And how much of a blessing that was. Why? Because she could focus on her career. She could focus on her own life. She could focus on her. It's a very selfish approach. Uh, marriage is often dictated with what? A ball and a chain. What does that mean? It's like slavery. It's not slavery. Let me ask you something. Men have needs, right? Women have needs, right? Why do we why did God make us in the way that we don't why did he not make us that we have the same needs and the same value of those needs? Does that make sense? Remember, men sometimes value one thing, and, and women, it's a need for them, but sometimes they value it here, and then some of the needs that women have, it's right here, and then men value it right here. Why didn't God just create us so that we have the equal needs and we equal value? Here's my thoughts on this, and this is speculation. Because in that type of world where we both value a specific need the same, we could be in a marriage, in the institution of marriage, and live quite selfishly, where we mutually use each other to fulfill our own needs. But God did something different. He put, okay, he said, men, you have these needs. Women, you have these needs. But sometimes you value this differently. So for marriage to work, you have to sacrificially serve each other. That's pretty powerful. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not built to be cuddly. I don't know you think, come on, you're the cuddliest dude I've ever seen in my life. I don't like to cuddle. But like, why? But my wife is built that way. And she needs it. In fact, if she don't get it, it's like you deprived her of oxygen. She starts getting all a little grumpy. She starts struggling. I have to serve her and minister to her and vice versa. That's what Paul's saying. What like, you got together for one of the aspects of reason is that you got this. You need to serve each other right here. Because they're real needs. They're real needs. So that's one application. It is, it is to serve one another mutually. More applications. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 through 6 says this. Do not deprive each other except, perhaps by mutual consent, both parties are aboard, and for a time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. We should be attentive to the fact that depriving our spouse of a real need makes them susceptible to sin. I have one couple I was counseling. Okay. And the man was, well, he lacked self-control. And he was caught looking at porno. And it tore his wife up, rightfully so. I mean, they thought of divorce. Because in, in a very real way, it's like having an adulterous affair. You know that, right? I mean, you were giving a tip. Jesus said it. He said, you committed adultery by looking lustfully right here. So, I mean, it did it. But she decided that she was going to stay in the relationship, which we encourage. But she decided to punish him. How? Cutting off the airflow, if you will. And I had to sit down, I had to have a conversation with her because, you know, I asked, do you want to stay in this relationship? Yes. Okay, well, let's look at the logic. The man has shown that he lacks self-control in this area. Am I right? Yes, he's looking. Okay, now you are depriving him. You made the promise. You came up in front of the preacher. You promised. You said, I, I, I promise. I'm the only one who's going to do this. I'm the only one who's going to fulfill this need. And now you cut him off. You're setting him up to fall. It's a very real thing. It's a very neat. When 
Joshua's sitting there. He's there. Wife is cut off the air. He's ultimately in control of his nose. He had to release. What Paul's arguing is like, you, when you come together, you made that promise. And if you've made that promise, you got to stick to it because we live in a horrible world. And it's going to be temptation out there. Out there. Let me hit something real quick and I'm going to close because I, I want to stress this. Um, I, I want to hit this really hard. There are, uh, there may be physical reasons, there may be geographical reasons, there may be selfish reasons that the needs cannot be met. Does that make sense? I think of, uh, um, what's the, the woman uh, in the wheelchair? Anna. Yeah. Where the husband, they made a promise, but there are real reasons why intimacy can't occur. Or there's geographical reasons. You know, when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, we got married, and it was about a week later, we spent a year apart. So there are geographical reasons. And there's selfish reasons out there that intimacy stops. Okay? Never, ever, and this scripture doesn't do it. I'm not up here and I'm stressing this right now. Does that ever justify misbehavior in a marriage? Does that make sense? I counseled somebody, and this was in Champaign, and, and neither one of them were meeting each other's needs, and, and it was like they were choking. It's, I can't breathe, and they were going to kill each other because they were mad because they made a promise and said, I'm, we're only going to, we agreed. You know, I'm meeting your needs, and I'm going to meet your needs, and they stop for whatever reason, and they're choking and gagging, and I said, you guys are setting yourself up for a really bad place because I'm telling you what, for whatever reason, Satan sends somebody. And next thing you know, in, in about two or three days, somebody's going to come over, and it's going to be a guy or a gal, and, and he's going to give the guy the attention that he's desperately needing, or he's going to give the girl the attention they need. You need to, you need to, we, we need to address this. Two days later, she has an affair. I said, why'd you do that? She said, you told me this was going to happen, so I was, I was looking for it. I was like, no! I quit counseling because I, I blew it. I said, as far as I'm concerned, you two... He's justified in leaving you. I said, I pray that doesn't happen. But you're the one ultimately in control. And never in the Bible does your obedience to God's word depend on the behavior of somebody else. Let me tell you how that means. Nowhere in the God's word does it say that you have to obey the command, do not kill, as long as somebody doesn't tick you off. Right? It says don't kill, but they deserve it. <laughs> Men, you are to be self-controlled regardless of your wife's obedience to God's command. Women, you are to be self-controlled regardless of the obedience to God's command. Make sense? just want to stress that. Because ultimately, you are held responsible. So, let me close. Husbands and wives, um, if, if, if you're new here and you don't come very often, we'll, we'll talk about something totally different next week, okay? It's not just marriage and, and uniques and, and snorkels. Uh, but hopefully you had some fun with at least the snorkels. Remember that, the snorkels? Were those the little creatures up in the water? I love those. Snorks? Whatever happened to them? I'm not closing with that. Let me close with this. Josh really wanted to communicate to his wife. Okay, you know, if, 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 if she would have kept it closed for a while and he was disappointed enough to where he didn't use the nose, eventually he's going to look at her and he may get a little agitated and he may even scream. Because he's trying to communicate to her something that he really, really needs. Husbands and wives, here's my question to you, my challenge to you. Sometimes... Your spouse is communicating to you a need that's not being met, and they're not doing it in a very nice way. I think you really need to step back, take a good look at your marriage, and ask, what is it that they're communicating? Remember, it's not just the intimacy here. There is the communication. There is the protection.
protection. There is the security. There's a whole list of things that we need that our spouse provides for us. That sacrificially serves us. What is your spouse trying to communicate to you today? Let's pray. <coughs> Father, you are a gracious God. You've given us need and you have given us a way to meet those needs in a ministry, Father, to serve one another, Father. I pray for every saint here, whatever, wherever they're at, uh, not married, single, uh, they are widowed, um, as they search uh, for your will in their lives. Uh, we thank you for the scripture. We thank you for this time that we have together. We ask that you continue to bless this congregation, Father, uh, as we grow in your word, as we learn obedience to it. It says that, that um, those who love you are known by their obedience. So um, I pray that as, as we learn uh, what you have to say on the different matters, we do. We, we follow it, uh, giving you the glory. This, this is what you said. We ask that you... Um, continue to direct us uh, and deal with us wherever we're at. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a time to do it.